Okay, welcome back everyone. So we will be talking about function approximations in reinforcement learning. And I hope this lecture would prepare us for understanding the more uh, specific kind of function approximation using neural nets on so-called deep neural, uh, deep reinforcement learning later on. So function approximations is, you know, one of the, um, I would say one of the most popular topics now in reinforcement learning research. So I hope, um, I hope to cover everything today. Um, but, you know, if we wanted to go through some of the details um, and, you know, um, if things go over time, that's fine. Uh, we do have a lot to cover today, um, but I wanted to make sure that we all understand um, the fundamentals of the function approximation in reinforcement learning, okay? I'll talk about uh, value function approximation as well as the uh, policy function approximation. Um, well, you know, just, an, just as an outline again, um, today is to cover the function and approximation of value function. Um, and this is the fourth topic that we will be covering for re reinforcement learning. Um, next lecture will be actor critic. Um, so we will introduce first the value function approximation. Then we'll talk about gradient methods and essentially a semi-gradient methods uh, using linear under the linear approximation. We'll talk about the least squares TD method. Okay, so that's what's, what we will be talking for value function approximation. But now for gradient function approximation, we'll talk about policy gradient methods, and we'll specifically talk about reinforce. Uh, you know, um, some of you have heard about that. So to start with the value function approximation, I think people are not very, uh, you know, people are already very familiar with function approximation is re basically representing value function as a table. It's not possible if you have large state space or continuous state space, right? So before we talk about TD methods, we talk about you know, using dynamic programming, we talk about using multi carl methods, we talk about Q-learning SAR SARSA, um, but many of them, we kind of assume that there is a finite number of states and a finite number of actions um, and essentially, you know, they're tabular. So you have a, t t you know, you have a table in your memory that you are recording your current estimation of the value function or values, uh, you know, a state action value function or just the uh, state value function. So apparently this is not feasible for large state space or continuous state space. So what we really do is uh, you know, for the specific value function approximation, we will do parameterized function approximation with a weight, uh, with a weight vector, theta. Um, theta is a vector in n-dimensional space. So think about, you know, usually we think about neural networks is just, again, a weight vector, although it has a certain structure, like a composition of nonlinear functions as that gigantic weight vector. Of course, if you just straighten it into a vector of, you know, a neural network, of weights of the neural network thought of as a weight vector. So here we say we have a weight vector theta in an n-dimensional space. We didn't say what is the size of n, okay? But usually we hope the n is much smaller than the cardinality of the state. Usually, you know, you could imagine the cardinality of a state space could be infinite. Right. So now with that parameterized function, you can write in approximation the value function at state s. So v pi of s can be approximated written, written as a function of the theta. Right, so and this function is still the estimated or the approximated. Sorry, I, I shouldn't say uh, uh, estimated. I should say approximated. The approximated value function at state s. Okay, and apparently I deliberately write this in terms of theta because it is really a function of theta. Right? So the problem is how do you learn theta, right? If you wanted to do a function value approximation, and essentially what is the form? of that parameterized function is also a problem. So 
like I said, the dimension of the theta is usually much less than the number of states. And so then, you know, it's natural to think about the quality of the value function across the summation, right? So we usually use a mean squared value error, so MSVE. So, you know, when I say MSVE of theta, I just mean this equation here. So take a second to look at this equation. What is d pi of s, first of all? Um, uh, you know, let's just ignore this for a second and just look at the v pi of s minus uh, v hat pi s theta. So this is just, you know, a uh, because I, I'm doing a squared, I'm also doing a summation over all the s, so it is natural to think about this as a mean squared uh, value error. But why do I have d pi s here? So the point here is that you don't, you know, each state are not equally important. Why? Because based on different policy, I might have, you know, a longer fraction of time being a, at state S1 versus S2, right? So, so indeed, we wanted to, you know, minimize the expected uh, mean squared value error. Like this thing has to be taken expectation over the states. Right, so that's why we need this pi, sorry, d pi of s, and we call it occupacing uh, frequency. So what it really means is just the fraction of time spent in s under the target policy pi. Okay, so is this fine? Um, well, so now the natural question you wanted to ask me is how do I get d pi of s, right? Oh, uh, well, you know, a spoiler alert, I mean, in practice, we usually don't need to evaluate d pi of s explicitly, but nonetheless, I still wanted to provide a method uh, to understand the evaluation of d pi of s, actually based on Bellman equation. Um, so here, uh, I wanted to first introduce a notation. h pi s, I'm going to use that to denote the probability that an episode begins in state s, okay? And then I'm also going to define another notation. E pi of s is going to be the average time steps spent in state s in a single episode. Okay, so this is already an average. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this system of equations. Of course, the systems of equations will have, um, you know, for different states, you will have a different equation. And for all the states, you will have a system of equations. And you're going to solve the system of equations. So what is the system of equation? So you can see e pi of s, right? So think about, you know, Bellman equation. This is very much like a Bellman equation. This is basically saying that the visit frequency of one state, so is e pi of s, is essentially equal to the probability that it is visited in the start plus, so that's the first term, plus the summation of probabilities that it, it, it is visited from other states, okay? So is this clear? So this is very much like a Bellman equation, right? So what is the Bellman equation? Bellman equation is just saying, you know, the value function at state S is equal to, you know, kind of the one step reward for that time and all the accumulated future rewards, right? So here, this is basically very much like a, you know, a Bellman equation, but nonetheless, you can see this e pi of s is just the average time step spending state s and, you know, corresponding e pi s prime would also be the average time spent in a state s prime. So, you know, you can see you would have the system of equations for all the s and s prime, right? Um, and so, so you can just solve it using dynamic programming. But of course, I'm assuming that, you know, the transition probability is already known, uh, which is not realistic, right? So that's what I'm saying. As I said earlier, Although I wanted to tell you how we would come up with such a d pi of s, but in practice, we will not do that. And I'll make that clear why in a second. 
Okay, so, oh, by the way, I didn't finally say that the d pi of s then is just a normalized version of these e pi s, right? So it's just um, because of the, you know, probability vector. So you essentially wanted to normalize this so that they are summing up to one. Okay. So is this clear, right? So this is the slide really the takeaway message is, you know, to measure the quality of the value function approximation, usually we'll use a mean squared value error, MSVE for theta, okay? Of course, this will be evaluated differently for different theta. Okay, so um, I didn't see any questions on the chat. I would assume that's fine. So now, you know, since I said we were going to look at the gradient methods um, for function approximation, so it's, very natural, you know, to to evaluate or to estimate the theta, you use a gradient method to minimize the MSV of theta. Okay, so what do we do? Um, assuming that this function approximation that you do, you know, we haven't specified what it is yet, but let's just say, let's say it's differentiable, which is usually the case, um, you know, if you define a differentiable function. Uh, for your approximation. And of course, you know, most of us would do that. Then we would update theta as follows, right? So theta is a vector, right? It has n, you know, entries, theta one, theta two, all the way to theta n. Um, I'm writing this transpose here just to show that this is a column vector, just a convention, right? We usually write vectors as a column vector. So theta t plus one now, so this is not related to well, this might be related to time, but you could also think about this is the so-called like, you know, update step in a stochastic gradient descent kind of methods, right? So, or not even stochastic or gradient descent methods, you would also have a, um, you know, time for that update. And this is very similar to that as well. But coinc coincidentally, um, because we are in the RL environment, so this T also, you know, is used to denote the time uh, of the transitioning uh, between the states. So you can see that, you know, theta T plus one equals to theta T, right? So this is nothing but just like something, um, should I say it's just like, you know, using the previous estimation of the theta. Um, and so what is it? It is going to be updated through this equation here. Um, what is this equation? Gradient descent, right? You wanted to minimize something. So the only thing is like the learning rate is not alpha, but half alpha. Why? It's just, you know, it's just, it's fine. You know, denote it as half alpha or alpha doesn't really matter. I think this is for the simplicity of this, you know, squared term here, you know, for the math simplicity, but essentially it doesn't matter. Um, so the learning rate and the gradient evaluated at theta t. Okay. So this is, so it's made, made it very clear. This is evaluator theta t. Okay. So now if you write it out, you can see, you know, based on very simple, uh, you know, math, you can see this is just the difference between these two value functions, the ground truth and your approximation, and then taking the derivative with respect to theta. Okay, again, you evaluate theta t, right? So what this is saying is, you know, so one sample of ST mapping from, from ST to V pi ST consists of a state ST and is true value under policy pi, right? So the sky here is the true value. And of course, also the ST itself, right? So then, of course, um, we assume that the states appear in examples with the same DS distribution. 
And now you can see why I said, although you are essentially minimizing the mean squared value error. So let's see here. So although you have this d pi s term here, in practice, because your st is kind of sampled based on this distribution, right? As long as you follow the pi, the distribution of the states that you are seeing will be coming from this distribution. So therefore, you can see in the next slide, we don't need this d pi of s here. So does that make sense? Any questions here? Why we don't have the d pi of s, but we're still doing, you know, the expectation somehow is still that. Right? This is very important. Different from supervised learning, where the data points are usually assumed to be equal, uh, equally important. Right. So here, you know, it's intrinsic that in reinforcement learning, the state actions are not state action pairs or just the states themselves are not equal, right? They have different importance. And essentially these are the d pi s. But you know, the reason why a lot of algorithms do not explicitly evaluate those is because by accumulating samples from your trajectory, you're essentially observing them in their distribution, right? So the realizations of these trajectories are essentially following these distributions. And that's why reinforcement learning could be sample inefficient. Because you first need to you know, use a lot of examples to evaluate the d pi of s, although you're not explicitly doing that. right? So you wanted to have a good estimation of the d pi of s in order for you to actually minimizing the MSVE of theta. So let me see. Um, does one half supposed to be one? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's a constant factor, right? So it could be, you know, combined with the alpha. I mean, it's just a reparameterization of your learning rate. So whether half or not is just for notational simplicity. Okay. So so far so good. Before we jump to this red point. Let me pause for five seconds for questions. Okay, so in practice, true value is not available, right? So the sky, you don't know that. So what do you do? Usually people would use a noisy estimate, right? So if for example, if you use some kind of unbiased estimator, then theta t will be guaranteed to converge to local optimal for decreasing alpha, decreasing learning rate. I mean, this is again, you know, uh, related to optimization, but we don't have time to prove some kind of convergence here. Okay, so then the question really comes, how do you estimate the true value a naive way to do that is through some kind of Monte Carlo, right? Because the value function, again, you can be estimated through trajectories. So you can just look at, you can, you can probably estimate the true values based on your observed uh, rewards, like accumulator rewards for the states, right? So you can do that using Monte Carlo kind of methods. But of course, the drawback would be it will it will be very sample inefficient. You would need a lot of samples to observe the rewards for those states. And you know, unfortunately, if you have a very small probability for that state under policy pi, meaning like when you are you know implementing policy pi, some of those states you might never encounter. I mean, in the extreme cases, you might never encounter, but you know, even under minor uh, conditions that you might have a smaller probability of going to these states, then it's problematic, right? So you will essentially need more observations or more samples to have a confident estimation of these values in these states, okay? So this is an intrinsic problem 
about the inequality or like, you know, states are not equally important. And that's a fundamental problem for, you know, the sample complexities of our algorithms. Um, okay, so however, we're not going to use a, you know, Monte Carlo methods to do the evaluation of the uh, value one truth value function. What we will do today, and you know, essentially what we'll introduce is some something called a semi gradient methods. So on top of what we've already introduced as a gradient methods for function approximation methods, I wanted to introduce something instead of using Monte Carlo to estimate the value function, we wanted to use the TD updates for predicting using stochastic gradient descent. And essentially what I really mean is we wanted to perform bootstrapping based on the current value of the weight vectors theta t. And this prediction will apparently be biased. Um, so it is not a true gradient based methods and that's why we call it semi gradient methods. And we'll see how it goes. Actually to illustrate how it goes, I wanted to use a simple example of linear function approximation. So now we would know exactly the form of the function approximation we will use, and you know we will use a linear one for simplicity. So now you know you have this function, uh, linear function approximation v hat pi s theta would just be theta transpose, right? right? So it becomes a row uh, vector now after transpose. And then the phi of s, so phi of s is the feature function, right? It will be also a vector in n-dimensional space, and it maps a state to an n-dimensional feature vector. Okay, so this is a linear function approximation. But of course, if you have a neural network, then this will be nonlinear. It will be compositions of nonlinear functions. Okay, so theta is the parameter of your function approximation. Think about that as you know the weight of the neural network, although this is a linear neural network. And the phi of s is nothing but the input to that neural network, that linear neural network, of course. So recall what we do for stochastic gradient descent from the last slides. So with that theta t plus one, it's going to be updated through theta t uh, minus half learning rate. Um, and the difference between the ground truth and your function approximation evaluated at theta t, and then the gradient with respect to theta. Okay, so of course, you know, since we have already said, you know, this example is a linear approximation, then we can see under the linear approximation, the gradient is very simple, right? This gradient is nothing but the feature function. So that's, you know, the simplicity here. Now, therefore, the stochastic gradient descent update for linear function approximation essentially becomes this term, right? So this term remains the same, but the gradient has become the phi of s. Of course, now it is evaluated as st because we are doing stochastic gradient descent. So everything is based on the current observation at time t. Okay, so this is phi of st. Oh, one second. Okay, so any questions so far? What is the stochastic gradient descent update for a linear function approximation? Uh, I have a like motivational question. So, okay. Uh, so like we we saw how to estimate the value of the value function, right? Using either TD updates or Monte Carlo uh, thing. So this linear approximation, like what is the motivation behind it? Like where it is used and... Uh, we haven't talked about any function approximation form yet. We're yeah. Trying to make it as general as possible. But here I wanted to use a linear function approximation. So think about you know, the hypothesis that I'm just hypothesizing that, you know, my function, my value function is a linear thing with respect to my feature vector theta, the uh, field of S. So that's my hypothesis. Of okay. course, uh, yeah, go ahead. 
okay i got it so it's like uh, in the previous lecture we looked at how to compute the or approximate this value and now we are trying to approximate uh, basically learn a function for this value function exactly. oh. oh okay so the value function approximation is essentially for learning the theta yeah so the goal is to learn the theta sorry i didn't make that clear oh. right so you know just like uh think about you know in supervised learning what are you trying to do for classification you wanted to throw a neural network on these you know data points and you know you wanted to learn the weight of the neural network Right. So mm -hmm. here as well, I wanted to learn the weight of my, um, you know, neural network and this neural network is for function approximation. Okay, got it. Uh, for value function approximation, of course. I mean, neural network is always a function approximation. But... Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay so you. now I'm using a simple, I guess, you know, if your question is, why do I use media? Um, so I don't have a motivation. It's just that I think linear is easy to, um, to analyze like theoretically and i wanted to show a simple case using linear approximation okay thank you yeah well just like you know someone might be saying why do i use svm right so again you're like you know assuming a simple hypothesis that um okay so of course you know um, you might argue it will have intrinsic error so let me go back to this Oh, where was I here? Yeah. Okay, so I'm done with the linear approximation and I hope this is clear. So now with this term, with this theta t plus one equals to theta t minus half alpha, the difference between you know, the ground truth value minus now, you know, my approximation is a linear function. So I know how exactly to write it. So it's theta t transpose. Now theta t is your current update, updated value or current estimation of the uh, weight of the, you know, function approximator and, you know, the feature uh, vector, right? So like an input to a neural network and then the current, um, you know, uh, gradient, which is also the input. So, so the semi-gradient TD update for linear function approximation actually is quite interesting. And I wanted to use this example to show you some interesting results. So like I said, we're not going to use gradient method. We're going to use TD update. So it is to use TD update to estimate the true value instead of using Monte Carlo. It's gonna be biased. But you know, um, we're still going to use it. So what do we do, right? So first, I'm just rewriting this update equation, right? So this is nothing but a rewrite of that from the previous slide. Um, and now, you know, because I'm going to use TD method, temporal difference methods, so I will do this, right? This is very, you know, exactly what we learned last time. So this is the um, kind of the TD error. You know, I'm, I'm replacing this with my TD error. Okay, so any objections here? Or I guess questions here. So you can see now I'm actually transferring my ground. So I'm, I'm like replacing my ground truth value with my current estimation of the values using TD methods, you can see, right? So this is V pi of ST. It is not related to my theta T. Whereas once the V hat pi of ST plus one theta T and V hat pi ST theta T are the value function estimated using my current theta T, right? And since the value function is just a linear function, then I can of course write it out so it becomes RT plus one with this, you know, um, instantiated value function. So it's now theta T, my current estimation of the theta, transpose phi as T plus one. And here, of course, theta T transpose phi as T, right? So these are my current estimation using my linear function approximation, right? So nothing, you know, really strange so far. Uh, well. Now, what I'm doing here is I rearrange 
of the you know of the terms. So it's perfectly equal. I'm just rearranging terms so that we have this r t plus one p of s t minus p of s t. So here nothing is related to theta, right? So this is just something uh, related to p of s t. So similarly here, this term is also something related to p of s t. But this only here, I've collected everything related to theta t in this form. So this is the only term theta t here. Okay, so now, you know, what's going on is once the system has reached steady state, so that means that for any given theta t, the expected next weight vector of weight vector is going to be expectation of theta t plus one conditional theta t would be something like theta t plus alpha and a b vector minus a, a matrix multiplied with theta t. So this is really interesting, you know, because of this observation here, you can see that we can actually have a kind of a fixed point kind of thing, right? So what is the fixed point of this update? It essentially becomes this term, right? right? So if the system converges to theta, then the B minus A theta will be zero. Okay, so, so this step, I'm not doing anything, but just, you know, putting these equation, rearranging it and put it in a matrix format, right? So it essentially becomes this theta T plus alpha B minus A theta. I'm just putting this term into a matrix form, okay? So, you know, the B is just this guy and, you know, A is just this expectation here. So what's really interesting is that once the system converges to theta, then the B minus A theta will be zero. Okay, I'm gonna pause for another seven seconds for questions. Okay, so what's really interesting is now because of the observation in the previous slides, we're going to, we're ready to introduce so-called the least squares TD. And essentially, why do we call it least squares TD? So, because we know that the TD with linear function approximation is essentially converges asymptotically uh, if we choose the appropriate decreasing step sizes alpha, uh, it will converge asymptotically to the TD fixed point, right? This is some knowledge we would um, you know, accumulate by learning optimization. So essentially this TD fixed point would have theta equals to A inverse of B, right? Due to this thing here. Oh, what happened? Oh, sorry. One second, right? So because of this, yeah, you know, if the system converges, then B minus A theta is zero. And that's why we're claiming here that if it is the TD fixed point, theta will be A inverse B. And now what's really interesting is if you look at A and B, you can see they're not related to theta. They actually, are some expectations that are only related to phi of st. So A is only related to phi of st and phi of st plus one, right? So you would take some expectation over some kind of policy to get these expectations. Uh, why? Because you would have to understand this uh, phi of st plus one from some kind of uh, distribute uh, from some kind of transition, right? Also. This B, small b here also doesn't depend on theta, but only depends on phi of st and this rt plus one. So what is this rt plus one? It's just some kind of expected reward for every step. Okay, so if you were able to evaluate these terms, then essentially 
You don't need to compute the solution iteratively. That's the major message here. What you can do is essentially you can just calculate A and B, which are a bunch of expectations, right? This is the expectation of A, expectation of B. You know, no matter what policy you're taking or whatever data you have, you can you know, accumulate the data and calculate this expectation, you know, A and B. And then you can just find the fixed point, right? You can just do at least squares problem to find your theta and theta essentially is, you know, A inverse B. Okay, so that's the takeaway message. You can see that if you use a semi-gradient TD kind of update for a linear function approximation, you don't need to do anything iteratively. You can actually just solve a fixed point problem using at least squares. So it's essentially reducing to at least squares problem because you just you, you know calculate A and calculate B, and you just do A inverse of B, which is you know some kind of very standard least squares problem. Okay, so you know this is something called a semi-gradient TD update, right? It's a variant of the gradient method for function approximation. Of course, the simplicity that here we observe is coming from the simplicity of the function approximation, because we're using a linear function approximation. But you could imagine that you could do some kind of, you know, um, approximation of the function using a second order kind of um, function or something like that. Okay, so um, I mean, here I just wanted to show you that it doesn't even have to be iterative. You can just calculate the expectation and you can very easily solve the learning problem of the function, you know, the theta, the learning of the theta through at least square problem. Is there any question here? Am I going a little bit too fast or? Okay, <laughs> thanks Michael for confirming this. Okay, wonderful, okay. So let's move on to policy function approximation, right? So we talked about a you know, value function. Now it's the policy function approximation. Well, actually, you know, we will be starting with policy gradient method that everyone has heard about. Right? So it's the, one of the most popular methods in reinforcement learning. So policy gradient methods essentially learn a parameterized policy. Again, you know, I'm trying to make this as general as possible. So it would cover, you know, neural networks. But, you know, like I said, in order to give you a very concrete analysis for notational simplicity, for example, in previous slides, I was using a linear function approximation. So here, I didn't want to specify exactly what is the policy or what is the parameterized policy. Um, but, you know, let's first make it as general as possible to come up with some conclusions so that these conclusions hopefully will be used in as many um, forms of parameterization as possible. So policy gradient methods can learn a parameterized policy that can select actions without needing to compute a value function. So this is really important. You know, this without needing to compute a value function is very important. Actually, in our analysis, you will still see value functions, but in the end, or assure you that we won't be calculating a value function explicitly. Okay, so for now, you know, this is a spoiler alert that we will be having some kind of value function in the analysis, but I assure you that those will not happen in your algorithm. So this policy gradient methods essentially is really, you know, because of this function approximation for policy, right? Policy pi is parameterized using omega here. Uh, so before we use theta for value function approximation, now uh, you know we use omega to denote the parameterized function for policy pi. 
Okay. So again, you know, uh, although this might be a views of notation, I didn't mean to say they are of the same dimensionality, but just let I me mean, use, you know, a vector of length n to denote this parameterization. So now the pi a given s and omega, right? So before pi is always going to be like pi of a given s, but now, you know, since I said it's going to be a function, you know, parameterized by omega, then I'll just write it as pi a given s and omega, right? So this doesn't mean that your condition don't omega, this means that pi a given s and this is a function of omega, right? So it is just probability of, again, you know, a t equals to a condition on s t equals to s. And again, this omega t right now, it is just evaluated uh, or, you know, the current estimation of the omega t, the parameter is just the omega. Does this make sense? I don't want everyone to think of this as a conditional probability. This is just a way of saying it is a conditional probability, but it's parameterized using omega t. Okay. All right. So for instance, I'm going to show you a Gibbs policy. Um, this is, you know, many of you recognize this as like a soft max kind of thing, right? But this, so this Gibbs policy is just like taking the exponential of the linear thing. So it's omega transpose psi of SA. So psi of SA, again, is a feature function, just like you know, the uh, phi of S before we were saying uh, that was a feature function for state. Now psi of S is a feature function for a state action pair. Okay. So now this expectation of the omega transpose psi SA. So, you know, omega transpose psi SA is just a linear function. Uh, of course, it's linear in terms of the omega and in terms of the feature function. Of course, the feature function itself could be nonlinear, right? But so, you know, you're going to look at this linear function and then take the ex exponential and normalize it, just like a soft max everyone, you know, are familiar with. So that's the Gibbs policy. I'm just showing like one example of how usually people, um, you know, parameterize the policy. So now given a performance measure, somehow we haven't talked about what is the performance measure before, you know, in function approximation, we said it is the MSVE, mean square value error of theta. Now we're just saying this performance measure is J of omega, right? So now it's parameterized for omega, so it's J of omega. What is it? Um, we haven't said it, but we will say that in a second. So given a performance measure, the gradient is gonna be omega t plus one equals to omega t. Uh, plus alpha of this gradient of j omega t. So this is gradient a set because you're trying to maximize uh, rather than minimize. Okay, so this is something, uh, you know, wanted to make sure. So now here comes the confusion part or like, you know, something that people might be confused. I claimed that the policy gradient method would learn a parameterized policy that can select action. So emphasize without needing to compute a value function. But now I'm actually saying, okay, so this performance measure is typically this guy here. So it's like a value, it's an expected value function, take an expectation over the state. And of course, this is the distribution of the states, like you know, how many fraction of times you will be at the state following pi like we already introduced at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, so now, you know, you might ask me, well, you said without need to compute a value function, but why is my JV still this guy? So I'll, you know, so to explain this, we'll see how eventually we will um, derive the actual, you know, the actual algorithm, although it's trying to, you know, maximize this value function, expected value function, take an expectation over a state. But indeed, the algorithm would not explicitly calculate any value function. Okay, so that's something I will have to assure you now, but you don't, you won't be able to see it until maybe in a few slides. Is that okay?
Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so now I will start with something like a policy gradient theorem. Well, actually, I have to say, you know, what I've been covering so far, usually, I think it's quite dense, right? If you haven't seen this, it might be, you know, rather dense for you. So, um, but I was trying to condense the material so that we can get, you know, the uh, most important concepts. So if you feel like a little bit intense, then, you know, I would suggest going back, take a look at the book, you know, ask your peers on Piazza. And, you know, you have always have the option to watch the recording now that we have the record, although we couldn't meet in person, but, you know, there's one thing that I really like about this is we can, we can have a recording of the lecture. So you can always go back and look at the recording. And of course, you guys are also doing awesome LaTeX scribing notes. So, you know, you could also go there and discuss with people. Okay. So I'm gonna start with this policy gradient theorem. Uh, what is the theorem? The theorem is this guy. So it's not very surprising, right? So of, of course I said, oh, sorry, this is too good. Okay, here. So as I said, this performance measure J omega is typically this expected value function, right? So of course, very importantly, I wanted to emphasize this is pi omega, right? So we'll, we'll make that clear. Now you can see, if I take a gradient of that J omega with respect to omega, then this will be this guy, right? This is very simple because, you know, because my value function V pi can be always written in summation of the Q pi multiplied with pi, right? So that's why the Q pi SA is not related to omega. However, this pi is related to omega. So therefore, when I take gradient with respect to omega, it's just this guy taking the expected, uh, taking gradient. So is this clear? Right? Well, it's a very simple theorem and actually it's like a one line proof. If you have J omega equals to this guy, you can multiply it out in terms of this form, right? Because of the summation of the A, you know, uh, with the weight of the pi. Um, and then, of course, the gradient becomes this guy. Oh, there is a typo here. Sorry. Yeah. Even in this one line of proof, I have a typo. Apologize for that. But the theorem is fine. Okay. Okay. So now, um, you know, I'm going to introduce this kind of reinforce. Uh, step by step. So, you know, from the policy gradient theorem, you get the sky, right? So the gradient of the J omega with respect to omega is just this thing here. So again, you will see I have this D pi of S, right? I have the value function, which again, you know, you will be, you know, confused because we said we, without need of a value function. Um, and then, you know, normally you would have the gradient with respect to omega for this pi. A pi is a function parameterized by omega. So this is not very surprising, but this one is again annoying because we don't know how to, you know, get it. And this guy is strange because, you know, we said we know we will not require a value function. But nonetheless, this policy gradient theorem gives us an exact expression for the gradient. Okay, so we would need a sampling method whose expectation equals or approximates this expectation. So just like what we've introduced in, you know, value function approximation, we said, although your mean squares uh, value error, you know, is essentially like doing summation over the S and D pi of S, and this V pi of S thing. Really, when you're trying, or sorry, not V pi, the, the um, the difference between the ground truth and the approximated thing. So, but when we're really doing this gradient descent, or more specific, I wanted to say the stochastic gradient descent, because we're really looking at one sample at a time. So when we're looking at the stochastic gradient descent, again, because the, you know, if we are following this pi, then the kind of state action pairs that you're observing would be following this policy pi. Right? So 
that's the reason why, again, we wouldn't need to explicitly evaluate this D pile class. Very similar as to what we did before. But now this, you know, we still have this question of the Q pile of SA, but we will make that clear soon. So the basic, you know, most important thing is, you know, we wanted to have a sampling method whose expectation equals to or approximates this expect expression. Okay, so we won't be using this true gradient. We wanted to somehow use a stochastic version, a more noisy version of this guy. How do we do that? So we know this guy. Well, so we know this fact. This is a fact we would know, and you guys can take a closer look and check whether this is correct. So the expectation, right? So what is this expectation over? The first, take, you know, ignore this super uh, subscript for a second. Just look at this within the bracket. So you have gamma t, you know, this is just a, a discounting factor, it doesn't matter. You have the RT, right, which is the, re, um, like, how should we say, like accumulated uh, reward, right? Yeah, accumulated reward, that's return, sorry. Yeah, that's what you would call it. And then you have this term, which is the gradient of the pi, with respect to omega multi, uh, um, divided by the pi of a t, conditional st. Okay, so what you, you have this term. And now, you know, I'm claiming that it is equivalent, the expectation over this st, because here you can see apparently I'm conditioned on st here. So I'm taking expectation over all possible st under the policy pi and the transition probability from st to st plus one, rt plus one. So under this probability, I'm taking this expectation of this quantity and it will be equal to this guy here. What is this guy? Because I know that this part under this expectation would be q pi of st pi at, conditional st omega. Right? This is just the definition, based on definition, okay? And then this, this term is not changed. Uh, well, therefore, I only need to take expectation over ST, right? Because this term would not depend on anything else. I've already made it clear this is pi. So, you know, I don't need to write pi here again. So is this fine? Right, so this is a simple, um, you know, basically a, a kind of conceptual replacement of this, so you would get this equation. So now um, I'm saying, um, if you write it out, this expectation would be just, you know, summing over state, the probability of that state, and summing over action. Q pi S A and this term. So again, this is nothing but writing out what this expectation means, right? Because I wanted to take expectation over S T and how do I get S T? This is how I'm getting S T, okay? Very importantly, I wanted to notice that there is a pi A given S omega here. Why? Yeah, anyone wanting to explain why? So here you have this, this, right? So this is very. Why do we have this term here? We are, we can. This is kind of multiplying and dividing by the same. Yeah. Term. Yeah, so you can see. Um, okay, so let me use a different color. You can see what I have in my blue. This is the same, right? I haven't done anything here. Sorry. Uh, Although this, you know, the, the box bow has this AT, but here I have a summation over A. 
And then I have this term here, right? Pi of A given as an omega. Can people explain why? Just an expectation. Like you took an expectation over ST and implicitly over the policy. So exactly. Yeah, like Michael right. said as well. Yeah, exactly. So here, the AT, I'm looking at samples, right? I'm looking at each trajectory from a you know ST to AT to ST plus one and so on, right? And this trajectory is following a policy pi. So in order, you know, so if I write the expectation of these trajectories out. And essentially becomes, you know, whatever was in this bracket will be the same. And then I'm going to multiply with the probability of taking any action under any state, right? So I've just done over all the eight. This is just the expectation. Again, you know, because this term I'm conditioned on a specific S for ST. Now I wanted to take the probability of, you know, at any state S and then some over S. So this is again to give expectation over S. Right? So this is nothing but expectation. But I really wanted to emphasize for reinforcement learning, it's very easy to forget about, you know, you when you take expectation, you have to think about what is this policy, what is the you know importance of the state, what is the importance of the action. Right. So it is very important. And you know, a lot of um, I think it's easy to make such mistakes and I wanted to emphasize that we don't do, um, you know, make those mistakes. So what is really nice you can see now is with this expectation, you can see this will be canceled out, okay? And probably this will, you know, uh, motivate why we have this strange term to start with. Why do we do divided by pi? Okay, the reason is really we wanted to make sure that this thing in expectation is just the gradient of the J omega. Okay, so I, I kind of do it in the, you know, kind of a reverse engineering. Like, you know, when you are looking at a reinforced algorithm, you would start with this term here. But I'm just, you know, trying to tell you why, because if you take expectation of this term, it would essentially be the gradient, the policy gradient. Okay, is there any questions so far? So now essentially, um, you, know, you know, it's obvious that reinforces nothing but evaluates the policy gradient using this guy here, okay? Now you can see, I'm ready to explain why, although you know, my J omega is really related to a value function, I'm not really using the value function here because this is just a cumulated return. I can just, uh, you know, this is not related to a value function. I can just use a cumulative return and I can look at the expectation under pi of this cumulative return and then I work directly with the pi, okay? Take a gradient or uh, just the pi itself. Both are parameterized by my omega here. So now I kind of explained this, right? So we don't need d pi of s because, you know, um, without them, you know, they expect because the trajectories are essentially following d pi of s, so we don't really use d pi of s. But then the q pi of s a, we also don't explicitly, you know, evaluate them. We're just using returns. Okay. So this is essentially the reinforced algorithm. And um, actually, here, let me make it more uh, explicit. All right. So. Basically, as I said in the last uh, in the last slide, I said you're going to evaluate the gradient through this expectation of gamma t return t omega a uh, gradient of omega pi and divided by pi. And now, if you see it right, so this term by math, you know, by by some kind of basic um, you know, knowledge, you will see that this is just 
the gradient of the logarithm of pi. Okay, so this is just because, I mean, there's really no motivation. It's just because, simply because math. So it becomes the gradient of logarithm of pi, at given s t omega. Okay. And now you can just update the policy using this guy, right? Because this is like a stochastic gradient descent. So in expectation, you know, we know that this gradient in expectation would be the gradient of the J omega. So we can just use what in the bracket. And, and that's why, you know, you can see for each update, what you need to do is you need to have your current estimation of the return, right? Which, you know, of course you would have to estimate. And then using whatever policy, um, how should I say, you know, this whatever reparameterized uh, policy function and taking the logarithm and then taking the derivative with respect to omega. Okay, so this pi of at at the omega is, I, I still am keeping it very general now, but let's say if it is a Gibbs policy, then you can see it reduces to something like this. Because if it is a Gibbs policy, like this, you know, uh, what I said before, like a soft max kind of function, then the gradient of the logarithm, the pi, becomes a very simple form here. So now you kind of also understand why, you know, I kind of introduced the Gibbs policy or why people use Gibbs policy a lot, essentially because of this logarithm term. Right, we wanted to make sure that if you take gradient of the logarithm of the pi, then it becomes something really simple to evaluate. And essentially for a Gibbs policy, it's really uh, simple, right? It's just the psi vector itself, but you know, of course with some kind of normalization, but I guess now the normalization is really not divided because you know, before your normalization is really for exponential divided by exponential is this minus of this, summation pi psi st, oh, st a prime, okay? So, so is this clear? I mean, this is just a special case of parameterizing the pi using the Gibbs policy. And essentially the idea is really, you know, um, I guess this kind of motivates you why we have uh, designed the Gibbs policy that way. Well, or why you know we, we kind of use Gibbs policy is just because this logarithm we can really have a simple form. Okay, so now this is the I guess last slide for today is the reinforce uh, pseudo code. Um, so it is basically a recap of what we've already learned in the previous slides. So this is with an input. Right, is a differentiable policy parameterization. So it's pi a given s omega, right? For any alpha, that's also an input for your learning rate. Okay, so then you initialize with some kind of omega. Of course, this is you know very uh, normal for gradient-based methods. Like you start with some kind of initial gas. So the initial gas is just omega. Now you are going to do this recursively how do, or repeatedly. How do you do that? So you generate an episode, S0, A0, and R1. Right? So that's what time? And then S1, A1, R2, all the way to S, T, A, T. But very importantly, or following this pi here, okay? I wanted to pause a second for a question. You can see this is something kind of, this omega is what you initialized here. So maybe let's say if you initialize with a git policy, then you have to use that parameterized policy. So it's not some kind of underlying policy, but it's the policy that is following this reparameterization. So that's very important here to notice, okay? So now, you know, after you do this, you know, generation of the data using, you know, this episode, then what you do is you will have a for loop. 
for the update using policy gradient or you know reinforced essentially. So for each step from zero to t, and this is essentially your um, your your number of updates t capital T is this maximum number of updates you would do. So you first would calculate the RT. This is your current evaluation of your RT using this episode. Right? This episode has this trajectory. So you can accumulate the RT using that. Okay. So once you do that, then you are going to do this update based on this guy. Okay. Very simple. But you know, why we design it this way is not so simple. And you know what we just said was kind of some kind of um, analysis of making sense of this update at line seven. Okay. Well, so what is this applying implicitly? This is applying that your j omega that you're maximizing over is essentially some kind of this guy, right? Um, there is a lot that's hidden here, right? Yeah, I, I don't have space to write this here, but you know, so this is, you know, essentially implicitly saying that you're maximizing such a criterion, such an expected um, value. And also this is using stochastic gradient descent essentially, right? Okay, so the reason why it's logarithm only is because, you know, you're taking gradient only is because this, okay, sorry, it's really hard to write. The reason why you're doing logarithm at first, it might be very surprising. Why do I do logarithm? Right? People might say, oh, is this some kind of empirical thing? No, it's not. It's really principle, right? So the logarithm is just because It's just because of this, okay? Sorry, my handwriting is kind of strange. Okay, so to summarize, right? Because we are generating the episode here. So this makes us actually a Monte Carlo method. And also we're using episodes. So it's an episodic Monte Carlo policy gradient method. This is the policy gradient part. Okay. Um, anything else? Any any questions here? Let's see. Um, it is an expectation over the policy distribution. Uh, sorry, I, didn't, I missed this comment. Where was this referring to? Well, what, what, you were asking why we had the pi. Um, is like when we were dividing and multiplying oh, by pi. Where okay, that okay, yeah. Okay, apparently I missed that. Sorry. Okay, so that's the last slide. And, you know, um, today, this is the conclusion, a uh, concluding slide for today. So we talked about function approximation for value function as well as for policy functions. Um, and now, you know, next time after Thanksgiving, um, we will be talking about actor critic methods is a matter of algorithm. And essentially, finally, we'll talk about deep reinforcement learning. Uh, one reminder is that the progress reports, I've already looked at all of them. Um, actually, I looked at all of them a few days ago, but I haven't got time to uh, give everyone the feedback yet. Many of you, I wouldn't wanted to give you a feedback because I think you know most of them are going well, but I will in contact groups, so a small number of groups. Um, I feel like some of you might need a little bit of a chat, um, but I don't want to do this before Thanksgiving. I will, I will do it after Thanksgiving. So finally, I want to say happy holidays and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.